Right, hello everyone. Um, welcome, welcome. I'm Quentin Duro. I'm the director of uh, international studies, and so welcome all to uh, the senior capstone presentations. Um, so we'll get underway in a, in a couple of minutes. But uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank Megan and her crew for setting things up. Uh, Hi everyone. My name is May, and my research is titled "Vaccine Diplomacy as a Soft Power Tool." China's soft means to achieve hard realities during the COVID-19 pandemic. My research argues that to achieve its geopolitical goals and national interests during the COVID-19 pandemic, China uses vaccine diplomacy as part of their soft power play, which exhibits non-conventional qualities of soft power, being coercive, competition-driven, and inward-looking. In order to understand my argument, it is important to understand the literature of soft power. Soft power, a term coined by Joseph Nye in the late 1980s, describes the ability for countries to attract based on diplomacy, ideology, and cultural values. It is the ability to co-opt rather than coerce, as opposed to hard power, which uses military and economic threats. To provide context, China's foreign policy have been shown to be contradictory. On one hand, they are presenting inducements through soft power outreach, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative and vaccine diplomacy, while on the other hand, they are presenting threats through China's aggression in the South China Sea. This map here illustrates countries with claims in the South China Sea, and as you can see, China in red is claiming all of this territory in contested waters, among other smaller claimants. Regarding the conversation on China's vaccine diplomacy, I have found three main perspectives. The first one is positive views on China's vaccine diplomacy by scholars such as Suzuki and Yang, who describes China's outreach to less accessible countries as a way to promote health equity overall. Other scholars, such as Amankwa, Amoa, and Hinson, shows concerns and doubts as they theorize how this effort of vaccine diplomacy can create sources of dependencies and elicit reciprocal attachments in the long term. Other scholars focus on more inward influence of vaccine diplomacy, talking about vaccine nationalism and political legitimacy as a drive for this form of diplomacy. My research enters this conversation and bridges the gap by arguing us, by asking us to rethink the conventional understanding of soft power, that it can be coercive, competition-driven, and also inward-looking. By looking at reports on China's vaccine distribution, China's pledges, foreign policy on soft power during the COVID-19 pandemic, I have come to three main findings. The first one is that vaccine diplomacy serves as a coercive soft power for solidifying territorial sovereignty and alliance building. While Joseph Nye describes soft power as the antithesis to hard power, Mattern argues that soft power is rooted in hard power because there is a form of attraction that rests upon a country's hard power assets. In this case, China's hard power assets includes its economic power and military aggression in contested waters. This representational force can sway smaller countries to comply with its terms and conditions. This is shown through its diplomatic strategy to solidify territorial sovereignty as China's vaccine diplomacy is used as a moral undertone for its assertion in contested waters, the South China Sea. As for alliance building, recipients countries are found to have qualities that align with China's geopolitical goals. These countries have no formal ties with Taiwan, have close ties with China, and or considered important objectives in their Belt and Road Initiative. My second finding is vaccine diplomacy being competition-driven among shifting power dynamics in the international order. 
for context, there are two great powers, U.S. being described as the status quo or declining power, and China being described as a revisionist or rising power, and their tension presets the competition of, between their vaccine diplomacy outreach. China's outreach to Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia is often read as an effort to hedge against U.S. hegemony, although this was not always successful. As China was claimed to have been taking advantage and selling vaccines at a much higher price to Latin American governments at the same time, Southeast Asian nations aim to diversify their source of supply, being China, to avoid being a source of dependency given their assertion in South China Sea. On the other hand, U.S. outreach to Southeast Asia and Indo-Pacific through the Quad Alliance, which consists of U.S., Japan, Australia, and India, is read as an assertion of its presence in a Chinese-dominated market and region. This places pressure on smaller and middle power countries in the middle of a Sino-American geopolitical competition. My third finding focuses on the inward influence of vaccine diplomacy, as vaccine diplomacy and vaccine nationalism is a form of political legitimacy assurance for the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. This political reassurance is, can be seen through China's central television propaganda efforts. As the television portrays Sinopharm acceptance and celebration worldwide while omitting studies on its low efficacy rate and doubts. This seeks to elicit vaccine nationalism for nation building purposes. Michael Barr wrote an article on nation branding as a tool for nation building, similarly, Vaccine diplomacy boosts confidence in Chinese-made vaccines for Chinese public, and studies have shown how this correlates with trust in the government. While these inward-looking influence shown to be successful, it is important to address the lack of transparency and perpetuation of a biased narrative that prevents people from holding their government accountable for any of its mistakes. In conclusion, my Research challenges the normative claims of soft power, arguing that it is as much strategically crafted as hard power. It does not stand alone, but rather coupled with the representational force of hard power or hard power itself. By identifying the adverse effects of this form of soft power, my research encourages collaboration over competition, shedding light on the importance of multilateralism, for example, the COVAX initiative, and health interdependencies. Because during the time where humanitarian needs should be centered, the COVID-19 pandemic, this will help foster a collective and collaborative approach that transcends national interests and boundaries. Thank you for listening. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Henry Jenks and today I'll be talking about Water for Energy, a regional cooperative agreement to build peace and improve material conditions in Israel, Jordan, and Palestine. So first, just to give some background on the region, um, the map you see on the right is the region known as the Levant. Um, it consists of Jordan, Israel, Syria, Lebanon, and the Palestinian territories of the Gaza Strip, um, as well as the West Bank, which is to say the West Bank of the Jordan River. Climate change presents an existential threat to the region, which is one of the most climate change presents an existential threat to the region, which is one of the most water distressed on Earth. The historical water source of the region is the Jordan River and its many tributaries, which you can also see on this map. Um, however, there are major issues with the Jordan River basin, um, namely by the time the Jordan River, the Lower Jordan, I should say, reaches uh, Jordan as well as the West Bank. 90% of its flow has already been diverted upstream. This requires the West Bank and Jordan to find a new, sustainable water source. I advocate for the Water for Energy deal, which will enable the region to build peace and foster interdependence while also maximizing sustainable resource extraction. It would see Jordan export 600 megawatts of solar-powered energy to Israel for $180 million, and 
as well as an Israeli allocation of 200 million cubic meters of water through desalination to Jordan every year. I propose that a certain amount of water from the 200 million cubic meters should then be allocated for Palestinians in the West Bank to grant greater water autonomy as only 36% of West Bankers have access to running water. They are also part of the Jordan River Basin and therefore suffered from negative climate effects as well as the diversion upstream. The water for energy deal addresses the urgent need for sustainable energy resources while promoting a sense of shared destiny and mutual benefit. Through the Water for Energy deal, water from desalination and renewable energy from solar panels can improve living conditions and ease tensions and build peace from the ground up for Israelis, Jordanians, and Palestinians. The cornerstone for cooperation between the three parties in the peace is the peace deals of the 1990s. The first and second Oslo Accords were signed in 1993 and 1995, respectively. The Accords were meant to end the Israeli occupation of the West Bank after an interim period of five years, but the deal fell apart and Israeli occupation of the West Bank continues to this day, with the Palestinian Authority controlling just 17% of the area. The Accords created agreements to collaborate on water issues through the Joint Water Committee and other similar joint initiatives, but a new system is needed as the Accords serve as only a rough framework to govern the occupied West Bank. To govern the occupied West Bank, as again, the Accords were only interim. The 1994 Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty ended hostilities between the two countries, but ushered in a cold peace. The two countries acknowledged the need to cooperate on water and other natural resources, but ultimately fell short of meaningful cooperation. The international relations theory of neo-functionalism explains how economic cooperation in certain sectors leads to increased interdependence, possibly leading to a spillover effect in political integration and peace building. The theory was developed by Ernest B. Haas in 1958 to explain European integration stemming from the coal and steel community, which is now called the European Union. Cooperative agreements could pave the way for enhanced political dialogue and trust building, potentially e easing tensions in other contested areas. I also use the theory of ecological peace building, which emphasizes the role of cooperation and natural resource management between neighboring countries. This theory identifies confidence building initiatives as helpful in early stage peace building efforts, like the small steps taken in the aforementioned 1990s peace deals. Since the 90s, Jordanian policymakers have proposed two major deals other than the Water for Energy deal. The first being the Red to Dead Sea pipeline. The basic concept of this project is to construct desalination plants in the Jordanian port city of Aqaba, as well as the neighboring city, Israeli city of Eilat, here. The fresh desalinated water would be piped 200 miles north to the larger city of Amman, and the excess brackish water would be used to mitigate the evaporation of the Dead Sea. However, as the region is home to the Jordan Valley and the Dead Sea, the lowest spots on Earth, transporting the water presents a logistical challenge. It would see the creation of a desalination plant in Aqaba. Oh, sorry, I skipped ahead. The second proposed deal is called the National Water Carrier Project which would see the creation of a desalination plant in Aqaba, not in Eilat, and a similar 200-mile long pipeline to Amman. Along with the same logistical challenges presented in the Red to Dead pipeline, this deal is, per is only domestic and contains no regional partnerships and therefore contains no chance to foster relations between Israel, Jordan, and Palestine. In recent events, on November 8, 2022, Israel and Jordan signed a memorandum of understanding to work on the Water for Energy deal. However, a year later, on November 16, 2023, the Jordanian foreign minister, much to my dismay, canceled the MOU, citing the Israeli invasion of Gaza and Israeli barbers. Just last week, on December 4, King Abdullah II of Jordan signed a deal with the European Investment Bank at the COP28 summit to secure $320 million for the National Water Carrier Project. I ultimately argue that, that for the region to reap maximum benefit from the regional cooperative projects like the Water for Energy deal, there must be a political settlement to the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Furthermore, if the conflict, which is highly destabilizing to the region, could be settled politically, the Water for Energy deal could be just the start of a wave of regional integration and peace in an era defined by climate change. Thank you.
Okay, so today I will be presenting on my research that approaches understanding the 2017 referendum in Catalonia, an analysis into the causes, motivations, and validity of the separatist movement and how it reached the 2017 referendum. So I will begin with my thesis. The 2017 referendum in Catalonia was the result of their distinct national identity, historic oppression by the Spanish government, and general economic inequities. Some historic background necessary to situate the movement in the modern political sphere begins on September 11th of 1714, which brings us to the first day that the Catalans lost their independence to the Castilians, which is now what you consider the modern Spanish state. This date is, is relevant to many uh, cult, Catalan cultural elements and finds its relevance uh, very often in modern day politics. This brings us into the Carlist Wars between 1830s and 1870s, these were not necessarily conflicts directly between the Spanish government and the Catalans, but they did find themselves on opposite sides and was almost a precursor to the Spanish Civil War, where the Catalans and the uh, Castilians would find themselves once again pitted against each other. The end of the Spanish Civil War marked the beginning of Franco's reign over Spain, and this is a era that is famous for systematic oppression of the Catalans, but also many peoples within the Spanish state. Their language was revoked. They had in a, in a general inability to present their culture and speak freely without um, cruel punishment. Following Franco's death in Spain, there was a transition to democracy within Spain. It took about three years drafting a constitution which granted a semi-statute of autonomy within Catalonia. I say semi because it did not grant significant abilities to operate autonomously, nor did it recognize the nationhood of the Catalans. This did not happen until 2006, when a new statute of autonomy was implemented, one that formally recognized the Catalan nation as a separate people and granted some further autonomy. However, this was tragically struck down in 2010 by the Spanish government that claimed it was illegal and against the constitutional power of, this, of the Spanish state. This uh, revoked a lot of rights for the Catalan people and revoked the formal recognition of their nationhood as a people, which had massive nationalistic implications. These things were followed by the 2014 and 2017 referendum attempts, which were attempts to be voted out of Spain and be a separate state. So some of the existing literature in, these art, in this uh, sphere is I've broken up into three separate sections that will uh, be how I present the remainder of my research. The first of these is the histo histopolitical arguments for Catalan separatism. Many of these favor a idea of Spanish centrism, which is introduced by Eusebio Mujalion in 1980. This concept is meant to encompass a grander Span Spanish national identity, one that is meant to encomp encompass all of the regions in Spain and almost mute lots of other national identities, including the Catalans. This argument, however, falls short in its ability to consider economic policies as a motivating factor for the separation movement. Additionally, the nationalistic arguments touch on a distinct national identity, one that is based in its own cultural traditions and is not necessarily linked to the Castilian or Spanish identity. However, these additionally fall short in their ability to recognize economic, economic arguments for separation, and this, this lack loses some weight in their argument. Following into the economic arguments, they, these point to a disproportionate taxation and GDP figures for the Catalans, this is essentially noting on the lack of infrastructure reinvestment by the Spanish government back into the Catalan region. However, these arguments tend to have a very cynical view on the remainder of the separation movement, specifically on by Anthony Castells. These tend to touch on important economic disparities, however, uh, tend to discredit the nationalistic aspect of this movement. This brings me into the first segment of my findings, the histopolitical aspect. The, as I mentioned, Spanish centrism is a term introduced by Eusebio Mujalion, but I will use it, I use it in my research to demonstrate a push factor by the Spanish government that is a, a, a completely exclusionary to the Catalan national identity. The Spanish centrist identity has tended to encompass all of the other identities that exist within Spain. Many of these include Basque, Andalusian, Galician, and many others that have been swallowed into this grander Spanish national identity, the Catalans being one of those. This has motivated negative sentiments toward the Spanish state, along with significant uh, oppressive politics under Francisco Franco's reign. 
the lack of linguistic abilities and cultural expression under Franco has motivated many issues and poor sentiment within Catalonia and has uh, provided significant motivation for a separatist movement. The, additionally, the 2010 uh, strike down of autonomy within Catalonia, as I mentioned, uh, derecognized the nation as a separate nation within Spain, and this has further uh, been a manifestation of some Francoist and centrist policies that have remained as a culture within Catalonia. This brings me into a more modern aspect of this political conflict with Vox. Vox is a right-wing political party in Spain, and it represents an extreme right, the Partido Popular, is the more central right party, but Vox is a modern manifestation of Francoist ideology, one that is meant on pushing a Spanish Catholic historic identity, a traditional family, and one that opposes many Catalan ide ideologies, something that is completely counter to the Catalan national identity and has prompted significant political turmoil in the region and other regions of Spain. This brings me to the nationalistic aspect of the separatist movement. This is one of the most thriving factors within the Catalan separatist movement. And the sum summation of my findings points to the Catalan national identity exists in opposition to Spanish occupation and its distinct cultural features call for a separate national identity. The first thing I would like to point to is an experience of banal nationalism. This is a term coined by Michael Billig and points to the experience that one gains on a day-to-day -day basis existing in a nation. These kinds of things include seeing flags, hearing language, foods and other general cultural experiences, experiences that contribute to a general feeling of nationhood when you're in a place. And through my research and personal experience, you can see that the experience in Catalonia or Barcelona is completely different from Spain or Madrid. This experience is completely distinct and brings me into a, another way that the Catalans identify themselves through their language. After Francisco Franco's death, as I mentioned, it was in 1975, the Catalans saw a massive resurgence in their language and linguistic usage. This demonstrated a clear desire to be a distinct nation and the immediate ability for them to be practicing their language was all that they needed to completely resurge as a culture. Additionally, another key identifier is their othering against the Spanish government. Othering is a term that we typically use in identity to understand how we identify ourselves. And the Catalans identify themselves as not Spanish. This has been an identity for them throughout history and something that is repeated through many cultural aspects, such as the FC Barcelona soccer team. And lastly, my economic findings aspect. Throughout history, it can be seen that there has been uneven taxation against the Catalans, especially since the existence of Francisco Franco. The Additionally, the higher taxation has not seen a reinvestment into the region. These numbers are in around the 45% area for the disparity between tax paying and investment and present a clear issue within the uh, structure of the Spanish state. Additionally, this 2006 statute of autonomy that I mentioned allowed for further autonomy economically as well for the Catalans. And this saw a massive increase in global presence and they were being formally recognized by other provinces and uh, creating their own international trade relationships. A lot of these relationships still exist today and uh, present the ability to function autonomously and without the need for a Spanish state's uh, formal connections. So this brings me to my conclusions. There has been histopolitical oppression of the Catalans. The Catalan nation exists separate from the Spanish Economics tell a story of a Catalan nation that is operable without Spanish control, and the accumulation of these three factors led into the 2017 referendum attempt in Catalonia, and the Catalan separatist movement will not stop until the Catalan demands are met. Thank you. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Addy, and I will be presenting my research titled Donald Trump, America's Hero, Enemy Framing, Generalization, and the Villainization of the Latin American Community in the United States. So my thesis for this research is titled Trump's Unprecedented Narrative of Combining Populism and Enemy Framing is Correlated to a Rise in Political Engagement Within the Latin American Community, thus creating the foundations for a rising Latin American social movement. I separate the historical context into three separate categories, which I deem necessary in order to understand the underlying implications behind the Latin American community in the United States. The first one is the early 20th century, the second is the late 20th century, and then the third is the 21st century. 
So the early 20th century focuses a lot on racial tensions. So after after World War One, we had the Labor Appropriation Act, which established the border control that we know of today. Also, we have a surge of immigration from the southern border coming into the United States. And then post World War II, there's an increase in racial tensions between Latin Americans and the Anglo Americans. In the late 20th century, I needed necessary to focus a little bit more on the past presidents. So we have Eisenhower, who operated Operation Wetback, which was a mass deportation of Mexican Americans, and it was also one of the biggest mass deportations in U U.S. history. And then we have Ronald Reagan, who, although he granted permanent legal status to some immigrants, he did increase border restrictions and tackled unauthorized immigrants in the workforce heavily and severely. And then finally, in the 21st century, we have Donald Trump. In 2015, he announced his, run, his running for president. And then 2016, he wins the election. And then after that, between the years 2017 and 2019, we see an increase in things like travel bans, trade restrictions, pulling out of international affairs, and two times he has been impeached. Within my literature review, there are three main themes that I approach this research project to. The first one is Donald Trump's discriminatory rhetoric. We see things like American exceptionalism or a narrative of American exceptionalism, which is kind of viewed with the idea that America is better than the other. We can be better because we are basically doing things in a better way than other countries are. So it creates this separation between us and them. A second one is Trumpism and populism. Scholars argue that Trumpism is a new form of populism for modern day Donald Trump. The third one is boundary objects. This is the idea of taking a word like Mexican or taking a word like immigration and generalizing it and applying it to a group of people, but not necessarily focusing on what it actually means. And then the fourth is Trump's rhetorical signature, which authors argue as being spontaneous and unpredictable. The second topic is increased resistance and an increase in national identity and pride for for who. For example, Scholars argue that fear and anxiety around Trump's election led to pro-immigrant advocacy. We see this a lot more in the southern borders and in the east coast of major cities. And then second, there's this idea that a threat to immigration in one region is a threat to all. So if it happens in one place, we need to tackle it everywhere. And then the third section is political and civic engagement on the rise. There's an increase in frequency of discussion within Latin American regions, which therefore led to an increase in voter turnout, voter registration, education, etc. And I deem this research very significant for three reasons. The first one is media literacy. So understanding the power of language and the usage of specific language is very important scale to have when analyzing political climates. The second is analyzing the effectiveness of politicians. So understanding the implementations of political candidates and how their political views shape the current political climate. And then the third is holding politicians accountable. If this is not considered, then we are bound to continue to repeat cycles of injustice. With my research analysis, again, I broke it up into three different sections. The first are Trump tweets and statements. He uses this idea called enemy framing, where he frames a group of people to be the enemy. Again, this is a form of the American exceptionalism that we see. They are not one of us, so they are against us. They are the ones causing our problems. Heather Burke has this really good idea called an identification through antithesis, and that focuses on unity through the other person. So we are united together because we are not them. And then overall, again, blanket statements that we've talked about, the generalization of terms, these boundary objects. So then the question is, how does Trump address the Latin American community? We will get into that in a couple moments. The second is the American narrative presented by Trump, this idea of a master narrative. Kenneth Burke also describes master narratives as this grand story of a certain culture. For example, the American narrative or example of it would be something like Manifest Destiny. That is a master narrative. And then the third part is a shift in politics surrounding the Latin American community. How does fear and anxiety turn into activism and social engagement? Something we will also get into further in the presentation. These are a couple of examples of Donald Trump's tweets that I have used in my analysis. I apologize if you cannot read them. But the big issue that we see is that he's using Mexico and mostly all of them, but he's referring to the Latin American community as a whole. And one of these tweets, he's saying, I'm very proud to have brought the subject of illegal immigration back into discussion. He is finding himself that he's the one bringing immigration in. And then you also got to think about why is he using illegal immigration? Is he focusing on immigration as a whole? Why is it the fact that he's just using illegal? So these are all examples of just this enemy framing. He's framing them as rapists. He's framing them as the other person. And these are also a couple examples of public statements made by Trump. All these underlined sections, especially in the first in the first sentence is, I've been treated very unfairly. This judge is of Mexican heritage. I'm building a wall. 
I'm doing this, I'm doing that. There's all these eyes statements promoting him as the savior for what's happening to America right now. I'm going to fix the issues that the Latin Americans are creating. This is that Mimi framing, and this is the dehumanization. The second one talks about the stereotypes, drugs, crime, rapists. That's dehumanizing the Latin American community. And then the third one is, again, this idea of why is he using just illegal immigration? Why is it the illegal aspect he is focusing on, but then he's generalizing the Latin American community as all illegal immigrants? This is from his inauguration speech. All these underlying statements is this idea of this American narrative. So he only uses words like we and together when it applies to the country as a whole. This is him being a populist. He wants to apply, he wants to appeal to the general public as much as he can. So we see words like join, our country, for all our people, together, we, your, you. He uses these only when he wants to appeal to the public, but then again, he leaves out groups of people so it's this idea of if he wants to appeal to everyone, why is he leaving people out? So from that, my conclusion is that the constant pattern seen throughout Trump's rhetoric is his generalization of the Latin American population, either by framing all Latin American immigrants as illegal or simply uttering Mexicans as a generalized term to represent all Latin Americans. We know that this is not the truth. Trump frames himself as this American hero, like said in his inauguration speech. He's pointing out all the flaws and issues and deeming himself as the one to fix them. And then the third is Trump has failed to realize that all the fears and anxieties he created within the Latin American community have only led to political engagement of Latin Americans and to gain more education, voter registration, and support advocacy groups from across the nation. We see even outside of the Latin American community, groups have come together to kind of form advocacy groups and fighting for immigration, immigration rights, especially in more rural areas like on farms, on the outskirts of big cities. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. So the title of my research is Recognizing Reproductive Rights in Spain, Recognizing Catholicism's Impact on the Political Evolution of Abortion Discourse. The aim of this research is to illustrate how Catholicism has shaped the progression of abortion, of abortion rights in Spain. I first examine uh, approved, approved le legislation and then um, and then going into the usage of religious language and national identity and how those are projected by right-wing parties to influence political um, conversation and policy implementation. These factors will display how religious, and religious affiliations negatively impact the evolution of abortion discourse. Next, going into some context, first looking at the dictatorship of Francisco Franco, he, there were a lot of rigid gender roles con which confined women to a more private sphere, in a more private sphere as mothers and wives and employed oppressive laws that created a lack of separation between church and state. This then it coined the term national Catholicism, which had, which granted, un which would granted an unprecedented influence to the Catholic church. They had, influence over economic policies and women's rights and brand range to many more. Um, abortion being an issue of morality, re it restricted all forms of access, criminalizing it uh, indefinitely. Then during the transition to democracy, there was a lot of success for a secular government because the Spanish government wanted nothing to do with uh, the Franco dictatorship. And by doing that, they distanced themselves. Um, Post-dictatorship, post -dictatorship, then Rafael Ruiz Andres further discusses this division by using the idea of two Spains, one being completely secular and the other, and the other relying on religion as culture. Can you hear me? Um, and then looking at first approved legislation, the PSOE won an election in 1982 and promptly proposed a new legislation that would decriminalize abortion in three different ways, ethical, eugenic, and therapeutic. Although the conservative party at the time appealed the law citing that there were contradictions within the Spanish constitution. Two years after the initial 
initial appeal, the PSOE granted a new acceptable revision of the law with ultimately decriminalized abortion in all aspects. The ne Although negative consequences have emerged, anti-abortion groups harass non-governmental planning clinics and medical professionals lacked adequate training on how to perform safe and sanitary procedures. Luis Rodriguez Zapatero, the Prime Minister of Spain in 2010, proposed and passed a new legislation on the law titled The Law on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Voluntary Interruption of Pregnancy. There was major pushback from religious organizations and the Partido Popular, although it was ultimately passed and expanded accessibility and requirements, which marked Spain as one of the most progressive countries in Europe regarding abortion. Um, then in 2022, there is a new amendment from going back to the 2010 legislation, which granted even more access to women seeking abortion. From this, we can see that there is neither direct nor indirect religious influence, which granted the PSOE even more um, access to give more women access seeking abortion. Looking at political rhetoric, we see a shift away from a secular government with politics regarding abortion. Seen in the indirect influence of religion on right-wing parties, there is Partido Popular, a center-right party, and then Vox, a populist right-wing party. Religious rhetoric becomes, then becomes a tool as a way for actors, to, political actors, to shape their discourse within government. God's talk and coded communication can be applied to examine the ways this rhetoric is used. Benjamin Knoll and Cami Bolin define these terms through by saying God's talk, which invokes religious beliefs to define key issues and differentiate themselves from opponents, while coded communication tailors specific language to the audiences preventing negative re reactions from those who are less religious. Then in, 20, in 2011, Alberto Ruiz Galludon, a self-proclaimed Catholic and new justice minister, wanted to revert the 2010 law back to what it was in, 18, in 1985. To do this, he performed, he proposed a reform titled Law on the Protection of the Conceived, which you can then then you can, can then you can see on the bottom, compare it, human life must be respected and projected absolutely from the moment of conception. Um, the word conceived align, aligns with the Catholic beliefs and language found in the Catechism, and although this reform is not passed, the, the discourse reflected the Church's overall ideological goals. Fox's president, then in 2021, Fox's president, Santiago Abasco, expressed alignment with the Catholic Church, stating, we want the right to life to be defended in Spain and from conception to natural death, which then mirrors the phrase in the Evangelium Vitae, which says, to ensure that the laws and institutions of the state are in no way violate the right to life from conception to natural death, but rather protect it and promote it. This shared use of religious language, religious language and ideologies within the Pope create an indirect promotion of Vox's anti-abortion and anti-euthanasia views in a more religious context. Then, looking at the reimagination of national identity, Fox uses anti-gender ideologies, and in this case, anti-abortion stances, to construct a modernized version of Spanish national identity. <coughs> they frame themselves as defenders of the threatened Spanish culture, and opponents of the perceived culture of death seem to be promoted by liberal parties. They use this, these ideas to establish connection between its anti-abortion views and Catholicism. Which, fosters, which then fosters a new sense of religious identity rooted in religious culture. Framework of culturized religion intertwine, intertwines gender issues, specifically abort, abortion, with the already established, already established uh, religious culture and history of Spain. Um, Vox wants to revive and contemporize the lost religious identity by using anti-gender sentiments as a means to achieve this objective. They rejuvenate the historical correlation between religious identity and gender through the concept of a natural and traditional family. One aspect of a natural family is being able to bear children if given 
if ever given the opportunity. The argument of a natural family is framed under a natural, a nationalistic Catholic uh, values, which then believe that by opposing these values in any way, by opposing abortion, Vox says that it would it would put them one close, one step closer to having that traditional family structure. Although they have faced challenges, they have succeeded in creating a different type of discourse that is based on anti-gender, anti-abortion publicity. And then finally, um, we see an indirect religious influence on political discourse surrounding abortion. There has been an increasing amount of discussion with the aim to limit access and negatively impact rights that have already been implemented. This has been done through many different ways, proposed legislations, um, just overall discussions, political campaigns, things like that. And even with a clear religious and political affiliation, abortion rights have not been directly impacted. Instead, we see political actors have tried to implement new legislation and garner support for their views. While these attempts have failed, they have brought, in, they have brought increased publicity on the matters of abortion and gender policies in Spain in a more negative context than we might, that we haven't seen before. and today I'll be presenting my senior research title, I'm Not Black, I'm African, Exploring the Multiplicity of Porn African Identities Through Poetry, Social Media, and Mediated Interactions. However, I would like to open with a half of quote from James Baldwin. During a conversation with Nicole Giovanni on the Soul Network in 1971, Baldwin said, the reason people think it's important to be white is because they think it's important to be black. The simple utterance by Baldwin encapsulates a fundamental social principle prevalent within the United States, that being race, racial categories, and binaries, where white and black become opposing forces. They represent a binary wherein whiteness is virtuous, it's normative, it's human, and dominant, and then blackness then becomes a symbol of sin, non-humanness, slave, and the ultimate other. As we transition further into this presentation, you will find that this dichotomy is a central theme explored within my literature review. Within my review of literature, Frantz Fanon begins, with, uh, begins a conversation on blackness by examining it through the lens of the white gaze. Fanon states, for not only must the black man be black, he must be black in relation to the white man. This quote emphasizes the point that a black identity is beyond its observable physical characteristics but instead that identity is defined through its um, relationship to whiteness. The next quote, the white man who had woven me out of a thousand details, anecdotes, and stories, highlights the fact that whites are dominant in this relationship and that they have the power to create. This power imbalance present, or present between whites and blacks is also reflected in other scholars' works, such as Orlando Patterson and Frank Wilderson. In the next section of my literature review, I put B.J. Gates, Shelley Hebecker, Godfrey Asante, uh, and more in conversation on the racialization of foreign Africans. Gates highlights how Ethiopians were perceived as white Negroes by Europeans during their victory, uh, due to their victory in the Battle of Ottawa and their non-colonized status. While Hebecker, Lindsay, and the Puso highlight the challenges foreign African immigrants face when identifying as black while also shedding light on how the black racial category is not universally recognized, especially within the, uh, the Horn African community, where social classifications are done based on ethnicity, tribe, or clan. Furthermore, these scholars note that first-generation parents uphold cultural traditions, values, and language, while first- and second-generation youth experience greater forms of acculturation, influenced by their exposure to black American culture, notably music, slang, and fashion, and this mainly occurs in local schools. Lastly, uh, Juliana Hubbard explores how societal perceptions of blackness are typically harmful and stereotypic, but commonly stem from uh, the white imagination, fear, fantasy, and loss. So she, we, um, she brings back the white gaze again. And these views are perpetuated in popular media and in order to spread the idea of blackness to more isolated audiences. 
uh, while Andre Brock highlights how online black spaces challenge hegemonic white norms while simultaneously creating safe spaces for black conversations, cultural expressions, and hyphenated identities. All these scholars work collectively address different aspects of my research question. How do foreign Africans conceptualize, negotiate, and express their dual black and ethnic identity? I chose to focus on this question because I myself am Ethiopian and often thought of my own identity. As a child, I saw my Abishanis and blackness as two separate identities. One I felt proud to claim while the other I was told to reject. Over time, both identities existed harmoniously in me. Doing research on race and learning that it was a social construction instead of a biological disposition helped me embrace my blackness. Through it, or through my reclamation, I began to embody what I believe blackness to be. The essence of all things, it was pure love, sacrifice, and, per and perseverance personified. However, at the same time, I began questioning why so many more Africans distanced themselves from blackness. I also became curious about Horn Africans' racial and ethnic identity formation and how they chose to express it. And I believe my research is significant because it challenges the United States' rigid social or racial classification system that constantly overlooks uh, one's intersecting identities. I accomplished this by examining Horn African poetry and social media content. By doing so, I was able to get various perspectives on how dual Black and Horn African identities develop and how they were typically conveyed. My findings show that you can generally track Horn African racial identity development using William Cross's 1991 Negresis model. This model was also used in Godfrey Asante's paper, Becoming Black in America, exploring racial identity development of African immigrants. This model identifies a continuum that leads Black Americans to form a positive racial, uh, racial identity. And although this model was intended for Black Americans, I have personally expressed the attitudes that characterize each stage within my own identity formation, and I have also observed these traits among other Horn Africans. Moving on to the Urban Dictionary, I used it because it is an online crowdsourced dictionary that focuses on slang words, phrases, and cultural expressions found in pop culture and in internet culture. And I like how each definition is time sensitive, it's regionally oriented, and uh, individually specific. These are the common definitions found when you search Ethiopian, Somali, and Eritrean into the search bar. And though the first definition that Ethiopian mentioned is uncolonized past, Christian origins, and having very beautiful women, the rest of the definition centered on their lack of food, perpetuating the serving Ethiopian stereotype. While all definitions for Eritrean centered on its distinctiveness from Ethiopia, highlighting their independence and national identity. While definitions about Somali centered on their non-black or non-blackness, their ethnic ambiguity, and their diverse range of physical features. And surprisingly, there were no mentions of pirates. Moving on to Horn African poets. I have analyzed the poetic works of Hewitt Adelo, Debbie Elamaru, Kanan, Ifra Hussein, Tumbi Kilomorg, and um, Ariam Alula. Each poet described their identity through their name, their relationship with their family and what they've endured in the, in, the, in the United States as well as their home country. And each poet commands respect for their identity. They show pride in being Ethiopian, Eritrean, and Somali, while also acknowledging an aspect of their Black identity. Whether that be overtly saying they were both Black and Ethiopian, as in Timbi's poem, I am Rajit, rejecting or rejecting their Blackness altogether as seen in Kanan's poem, I come from, when he says, I come from a people who have never been or placing themselves in a larger theme of Black life as an Ifra's poem, highlighting how a Black woman's love and care has built and sustained its nations. Lastly, um, Horn African social media content reflects a mixture of both cultural heritage alongside pop culture and Black American culture. If you look on the images on the screen, you see common cultural jokes like all Horn Africans having large foreheads as a defining and identifiable physical feature. You see popular animated movies like The Incredibles to be imagined to fit a typical Somali family. You see uh, popular black celebrities like Emily Chakwa and Will and Veda Smith participating in Abishak culture. Um, the image on the bottom left is from a video skit on YouTube where an Ethiopian man is a passenger 
um, of a black Uber driver, and throughout the video, there is tension between the two. The Ethiopian man frequently makes uh, inappropriate remarks on the driver's blackness. And though it's meant to be comedic and lighthearted, uh, at its core, the video reflects common ideas held by Horn Africans against black people. In all, my research findings span across multiple mediums and address various aspects of a dual black and foreign African identity. However, throughout each medium, there are common experiences that connect them all, whether that be how foreign Africans look, the pride they have for their country, internalized anti-blackness or the complete opposite, full acceptance of their blackness. The foreign African community continues to utilize online spaces and social media to express themselves. Thank you. Hello everyone. So my name is Ming. Uh, my topic is on Congress nationalism in context of comparative analysis of Vietnam and China in this shifting geopolitical reality. So uh, in 1979, while Vietnam was fighting a Chinese backed Khmer Rouge in the south, the Chinese army launched a surprise attack on northern Vietnam. And Vietnam was then locked in a two-front conflict. The Chinese attack was swift, but the con the consequences and the implication were substantial. It reminded the Vietnamese ruling leaders of an ever-present threat from its northern neighbor, China. But why? Weren't Congress states supposed to stick together as comrades? It was mainly due to differences in ideology and in geopolitical priorities. So for my research paper, I want to explore the interplay between communism and geopolitical positioning within the nationalist context of the two surviving communist stronghold of Vietnam and China. I also divide the development of national identity in Vietnam and China into three main historical periods. Uh, each coincide with a priority that both communist regime push forward to safeguard its political legitimacy. The first period is revolutionary based, characterized by the hardcore emphasis on communist ideology a domestic program and anti-imperialist revolution. Next is performance-based period of economic performance, of reform and proliferation that promises prosperity for the people, even if it means shifting away from communist central planning economic system. And lastly, culture-based, reasserting the Communist Party as the rightful leader of the state as it represents the country's culture, history, and geopolitical fantasies, that is where and how the nation see itself on the international stage. So limited attention has been devoted to comparing the nationalist sentiment between Vietnam and China. However, efforts have been made to explore various components that constitute nationalism in both countries, tracing back their roots in culture, history, commerce development, and foreign policy. Among them is Brandy Walmart with his book, China and Vietnam, The Politics of Asymmetry. Tracing back thousands of years of bilateral relationship between Vietnam and China, Walmart explored this idea of asymmetrical relation, complicating it and problematizing it. To sum up the Sino-Vietnamese relation, he writes, China has always been a much more important presence for Vietnam than Vietnam has been for China. And Vietnam has had a more acute sense of risks and opportunities offered by this relationship. The notion of asymmetrical relation is fundamental to the study of Sino-Vietnamese relation, something that was built upon by many scholars after the Walmart. So just some historical background. The Sino-Vietnamese relation can be dated back thousands of years. Um, in the 19th century, both countries were being dominated by either Western powers or Japanese occupation. In China, this began a period known as the century of humiliation because this was for the first time in history china was no longer that middle kingdom that uh, huge center of the world the contemporary vietnamese and chinese state only came into existence in the 1940s both countries adopted communism and for national liberation and reform it was close combat for a long time until vietnam decided to get closer to the soviet union and adopt an interpretation of Marxist Leninist that Mao Zedong didn't like. And this was the condition that led to the Sino Vietnamese War that I mentioned earlier. So, ideology and geopolitics played a tremendous role uh, in forming the Vietnamese Chinese relation. 
So um, one of my main argument uh, with this research is that the development in national identity can, can be divided into three different historical periods, each coincide with the priority of the ruling communist regime in Vietnam and in China. And through the examination of these priorities, we will be able to paint a picture of how national identity in communist state has close relation with the effort to legitimize the ruling regime. So the communist state, unlike general thinking, uh, they are not rigid, but they are agile. They need to legitimize themselves through the balancing act of being uh, repressive and responsive to the need and the desire of its citizens. So Vietnam and China, they're both one party state. So also the need to make the national the sense of nationalism synonymous with the idea that you have to love and have to support the ruling communist regime is critical. And as history has shown, communism is neither the most successful or the least vulnerable political ideology. And that's why the awareness of regime collapse is always present. So the first period is the revolutionary phase. Uh, this was the period when both Vietnam and China adopt communism, the two newly founded states needed grand national projects to showcase the ideological appeal of communism. So that is why Vietnam and China put tremendous effort into the land reform project and were able to mobilize a massive base of rural supporters. However, these land reform were deadly. Vietnam's land reform was a toned down version of Chinese land reform. Oh, Mao Zedong, a great leap forward, which has led to the death of over 36 million people. Looking at the ideological and geopolitical aspect of both countries, it is visible that Vietnam is much more inward looking compared to that of China. Vietnam views communism as, uh, solely as a tool for dom domestic projects, such as to liberate the countries from like Western imperialism, that is the French and the American. But uh, meanwhile, China tried to export uh, its political ideology. A prominent importer of Maoism is Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge, which went on to massacre 2 million Cambodians and attack Vietnam. So the second period is performance based. Uh, during this period, both countries started economic reform and employ and market economy as they realized that the as they realized the vitality of economic performance to state legitimacy. So the need for economic growth was so substantial that the economic staple of communism, the central planning economy, was undermined. And of course, the ruling regime never admit that what they was doing was capitalism. So. The economic prosperity allows China to project its economic power abroad through international investment. The most prominent example will be the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, almost $1 trillion invested in infrastructure abroad, unmatched by any other country in the history. So um, last but not least, the cultural based period. Once people have become richer and more educated, the need for a sense of national identity that touches them on a deeper level is a must for the survival of the regime. So China is much more ambitious than Vietnam when it comes to the establishment of cultural-based legitimacy. More than a million Muslims being arbitrarily detained and many other Uyghurs subjected to intense surveillance, religious um, restrictions, forced laborers, is a part of China uh, assimilation project. The hosting of the Olympics in 2008 and again, in 2022, was spectacle not only to the world, but also to the Chinese people. Uh, China, now the Middle Kingdom, has returned. And since the idea that China was one so great before the century of humiliation is so baked into the thinking of Chinese people, uh, of the Chinese people, the reclamation of that global position is of tremendous meaning to the ruling Chinese uh, regime. So the Belt and Road Initiative is also a very casual one. Through the increased connectivity and the exchange of people, the Belt and Road Initiative has been used as a tool for cultural diplomacy and a tool as a soft power strategy. In Vietnam, the people and its leaders understand that the country neither has the ambition nor the ability to pretty much do what China does. So the ruling regime subdued to this global culture without substantial um, nationalist consequences. So, um, oh, it should be afterward. 
Um, so in conclusion, it is impossible to separate nationalist identity and the legitimacy of the state in modern communist regimes. It is also impossible to comprehend the sense of nationalism in the two countries of Vietnam and China without understanding how communism and their global ambitions work. The, the two authoritarian states will keep being flexible in developing the sense of national identity to adapt to the sh shifting geopolitical reality. And culture will continue to be the focus as China rise to become this global superpower, the anti-Western ideology will keep ascending. And Vietnam, on the other hand, due to this political hedging to counter China, will see more pro-Western ideas being promoted. Thank you. Good evening. My research is titled Heritage and Heritage, Preserving, Promoting, and Politicking within UNESCO at the British Museum. Okay. So first of all, we have UNESCO and the British Museum. How do they differ? So the UNESCO, when we're talking about that, we're referring specifically to the World Heritage Committee. There are a lot of umbrella committees and organizations rolled up under it, so it's important to zoom in there. It's oriented around monuments. So their mission is to kind of keep a list of the world's monuments, inscribe ones that are important to our collective heritage as regards humanity. And sites are selected based on that cultural significance. And a local shout out, the Hopewell Earthworks in Ohio recently joined the list. So that's pretty exciting. The British Museum is a very British, British institution. It's not so much a global one. Uh, famously holds the Elgin Marbles as well as a huge assortment of artifacts from other places around the world. And so you might be saying, these are a little bit of an apples to oranges situation. Why are we comparing the two of them? And while they are quite different, and oriented in very different ways, there are lessons that we can draw from both of them that we can learn about how to best take cultural heritage forward. So while quite different institutions, UNESCO has demonstrated a marked willingness to be adaptable, constantly reevaluating their approaches, their involvement of local authorities and experts, whereas the British Museum has stayed much more stagnant, very content to kind of stay in its lane as it's operated as a museum in general for quite a long time. So drawing on some of that adaptability the regional, regional involvement in general, just constantly reevaluating themselves is something that would really benefit the British Museum and other museums to draw in. So, before we get into cultural heritage, there are kind of three underlying dynamics that we need to look at identity, heritage, and protection. Identity uh, involves the way that artifacts and monuments affect a group's identity. So, there is importance from objects that are from an area. For example, there's a set of Danish golden horns that were unfortunately melted down that were instrumental in founding the modern Denmark. And there's also a lot of importance attached to objects from very far away from the area. The Elgin marbles were very important in creating the modern British state. So both of those are important to them. Then there's the issue of who owns the past and how should we address it. So there's the idea, does the past need to be preserved perfectly? We need to keep it in stasis. We need to keep it kind of in a time capsule sort of situation. Or is it much more important to examine the ways that the past and the present continue to impact each other every day? And to balance that choice, you have to look at stakeholders. How are we making these choices? Who do we need to involve? Who do we need to consult? It's a tricky balance to strike. And then you move into the dynamic of protection. So associations, heritage associations are responsible for safeguarding local monuments. So for example, the English Heritage Association is responsible for taking care of Stonehenge. And then that's included in the World Heritage List. So UNESCO kind of acts as this overall aegis. So there's this kind of local involvement paired with more global involvement. Museums have this uh, kind of essential autonomy regarding decisions on what to showcase. So this is complicated because both what you showcase and what you choose to not showcase are important. They both contribute to the uh, creation of an archive as we see with TRIO science is power. Silence is power. So it's a careful, you know, you've got to constantly reevaluating what are we putting out there and why. And then there's the issue of danger, both to monuments and to artifacts. Especially post-World War II, there was a lot of sell-off of collections in museums, both to private collectors. There was, some of them were just destroyed for convenience. So there's a careful, how can we best preserve these going forward? So to break down my analysis and findings, it essentially separates into three segments. First is on UNESCO, second is on British Museum, third is on bringing it together. How are these relevant? How do we draw lessons for both of them? And where do we go from here? First up is UNESCO. So UNESCO comes from, for many scholars, the Cold War. The term World Heritage was coined in the 60s at a White House conference. 
And many scholars see it as largely a gambit for more soft power. So persuasion through attraction. The idea was if you have more of these sites under your belt, you have a lot more kind of cultural sway to work with, uh, as opposed to hard power, which is more of your forced to achieve objectives. A lot of scholars have chosen to zo zoom in on this, as well as the idea that uh, managing these lists is kind of just down to kind of political blocking and power gains. I would argue that the decisions that they made in their resolutions and the, the choices they made as they continue to refine their approach and definitions of heritage demonstrate that they've done a lot in the opposite direction to kind of really focus in on their state of mission. Now, this is a little complicated because there's quite an imbalance going on here. As you can see, the top line that spikes up so sharply in the middle there is for the Europe and North America or EMA region. So there's been quite an imbalance in terms of properties inscribed per year. If you compare that to this table, boil down those results a little bit, 47.12% of inscribed sites are from Europe and North America. The next closest is 24.10% of the sites in Asia and the Pacific. So regardless of kind of the willingness to be evaluating things, there is still an imbalance. The important thing is that steps are being taken positively to improve this issue. Then we have the British Museum. So this is a screenshot taken directly from their homepage. This is from their About Us section. They describe themselves as the first national public museum of the world, which is a little bit of a, you know, it's a little bit of an oxymoron national end of the world. Uh, they describe themselves as unique and bringing together under one roof the cultures of the world spanning continents and oceans. No other museum is responsible for collections of the same depth and breadth, beauty and significance. They hold over 8 million artifacts. So many of those artifacts never see, never are out on exhibit. So there's three kind of underlying things here that we need to consider. So Alice Stevenson did a comprehensive profile on the British Museum in her piece, Ghosts, Orphans, and the Dispossessed, she talks about the idea that many of these artifacts, given no curator interest, since there's limited curators to go around, never see study. They're often forgotten for years. There was a recent issue where a scholar requested items to artifacts to view from the British Museum. It was found they've been sold off by an unscrupulous curator. So a lot of these artifacts, you know, they're neglected and we lose track of them. Flinders Petrie, the famous archaeologist, argued that this kind of concentration of artifacts should never be the case. He saw it as very good practice, good risk management to have them dispersed at multiple museums. And it facilitates really examining those artifacts. You really get to have the weight that they're due. There is, the British Museum argues that there's, you know, there's this concentration of expertise that comes from having all these artifacts to work with. Their conservators are some of the best trained in the world. They can send them on uh, tasks like there was a kiwi feather cloak in New Zealand that they recently sent a couple conservators to help out with. But with that 8 million artifacts, we have to consider why they're there. So some of the Egyptian excavation funds, excavation funds, early proponents had gone so far as to argue that in Egypt, sculptures when uncovered were doomed to certain destruction at the hands of the Arab and the traveler, and were never safe, to, safe until placed within the walls of the museum. So there's this idea that the places that these artifacts come from can't be trusted to take care of them. They have to be removed to the better knowing British Museum or any, you know, any other museum. And what do they do when they're there? They sit and rot in boxes and places like this where they might not be removed for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. It's not a place where the artifacts can experience the study and value that they're due, much less from the various stakeholders. If you're in Britain and you want to go look at these boxes, great. Many of these artifacts come from places that will never have a chance to come close to these. And are they best suited to remain here? So potential lessons that the British Museum can draw from the things that we've seen out of UNESCO. I would argue that if they choose to focus on that adaptability, that continued reflection on the choices they're making, and willingness to kind of take steps forward, change and adapt in the modern day, there are a lot of paths forward. So one is dispersal is diplomacy. In the case study of Singapore and France, Museums have seen some, uh, some significant success in making diplomatic outreach. They can act independently of their governments and set the stage for those governments to take broader steps forward. So there's a lot of potential there, both by spreading artifacts through exchange and temporary exhibition, as well as just giving away some of those 8 million artifacts that they, they come from. We have ideas like collective management where cataloging can be developed. So these artifacts that are there can get some of that study they do from places around the world, some cross country conservation. So there's a little bit of a share in the investment and management and conservation of these artifacts, you get a little bit more of a stake involved with those local institutions. That's something they can draw from UNESCO in particular with their kind of local, global crossover. 
expanding curatorship, more curators across the world can get those artifacts that have been studied. Expanding scholarship, if those artifacts are in more places, you don't have to hightail it to London to study them. Intermuseum loan, they're really expanding out those trade exhibitions. The British Museum tends to be very leery about selling off, giving away, or trading, or giving uh, for temporary exhibit any artifacts that they don't have duplicates of. So just really taking that step forward and saying, maybe we don't need to have 8 million, you know, unique or near unique objects. Developing digitization is a step forward that's gonna come from doing some of these things. So if these artifacts get out of those boxes and get to a place that will be studied, digitizing these artifacts and preserving them for people to study in ways that don't involve them having to have them physically can take some big steps forward. And really at the end of the day, that consideration of what they're doing, why they're doing it, how they're laying out their exhibits can really help us understand how the past and present are impacting one another and really set the stage for stakeholders, both from their point of origin or excavation of those artifacts and people who consume them and see a lot of value in them just from kind of living around them or visiting a museum can all have a say in how things go. So in conclusion, the British Museum and other museums, while very dissimilar from UNESCO and other heritage institutions, can really draw some lessons from that continued self-criticism, that continued examination of why are we doing this? How are we doing this? What are the best processes going forward? And at the end of the day, working in concert and trying to draw some of these lessons and continually evaluating our processes for heritage can let our heritage management go forward and lead to a much better sense of stewardship of our past for our future. Thank you.